May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Morning. So today is not only St. Patrick's Day, as I, there's a fair amount of green out there, not quite as much as I might have expected, but quite a bit of green. So happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. It's also the fifth and final Sunday of Lent. And since I only got to preach at the first one and the last one, today is a review. <laughs> it kind of is. So, because next week we're going to celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with Palm Sunday and begin that whole journey of Holy Week. We'll follow Jesus and his disciples as he's arrested, tried, crucified, as he washes their feet, eats Last Supper with them. And we'll stand in awe with those 12 disciples when Jesus rises from the dead and walks with them and talks with them and eats with them humbly before ascending into heaven. And I am reviewing these five weeks of Lent because they prepare us for this momentous week, for this momentous moment. They open our eyes and our hearts each week building on the next until this week, this fifth week, the turning point, the time when the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, the time when we are asked to hate our lives, to die to our old selves, and to reaffirm our, reaffirm our service to God, to love, to Christ. In that first week of Lent, we saw Jesus driven into the wilderness where he was accompanied by angels and wild beasts and tempted by Satan. In that moment, we begin the journey of Lent knowing that we are not alone when we find ourselves in the wilderness. Too often, we think of that story as needing to be alone when we're sad, but it's not that. He was with the angels. God was with him. God is with us, and God is in each other with us. So we begin Lent with that confession, that wilderness, and with admitting that we need each other because all of us are sinners. None of us are perfect. In the second week of Lent, when we heard the wonderful preaching of the Reverend Fred Chisholm, and also his story as a black man in New Hampshire, which was appropriate to that week. In that second week, God calls us, those of us who've been to the wilderness, found our way through, admitted our sinfulness. God calls us as sinners to pick up our crosses, to follow him, to reprioritize our values so that we can carry that cross and be untroubled by human things. And so here we are, two weeks in, Lent one, Lent two, admitting our humanity, our inability to do it on our own, and we have put things aside that hold us back from love, and we have knelt down to pick up the cross, agreed to do the hard work of love. We are on that part of our journey. And then, Jesus, as he always does, <laughs> we're like, okay, I got this. I think I'm going to do it. I'm okay. And Jesus is like, yep, nope. And he comes and he overturns all the tables. He's like, no. He reminds us that that cross, that that love it requires of us, isn't the church, isn't only in the temple. That the true temple rises in three days. The true temple is who? The risen Jesus. Our church is only a pathway to that love. And we must be so careful not to conflate the church with God. Because it all too often is. Week four of Lent, last week, is also known as Letere Sunday. And if we had them, 
we would have a rose frontal and I would be in a rose chasuble, which is the color of joy and love. Because last week is a moment of joy in the midst of all of that whew, wilderness and crosses and upturning of the tables and the exhaustion of that journey, God basically steps in to give us one mighty hug. God steps in and says, you've got this. I love you so much that I became a human to suffer with you, that I sent the child of me to you so that you could live. I love you that much. And so here we are at the point where for Christ there is no turning back. He's raised Lazarus from the dead. He's made the authorities mad. He's reached more Jews than anybody wants him to. And now the word has spread so far that the Greeks have showed up, that there's curiosity beyond his inner circle, curiosity beyond even his outer circle. There's curiosity in the world. And that's scary for the authorities. This is the point where we're asked when things have changed that much to follow him into transformation, to hate our life in this world and instead become servants in his world his servants in the world. He says, whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, there will my servant be also. This week, we commit, we covenant to go where Christ needs us to go. We face the wilderness, faced it together. We've looked at our values and reprioritized them to reflect God's word, not ours, picked up our crosses. We've worked to set our hearts not on worldly things, but on the temple that is Christ risen. And we have been assured of God's everlasting love. That when we are willing to let go of our attachment to worldly things, to look our sins in the face and change, we'll glimpse the love. Not God will love us, because God always loves us. We will glimpse the love that is always there. And today comes the hardest task of all, what this is building up to Lent. In light of God so loved the world, we are asked to deprioritize our lives as we know them, to consider them lesser than, to hate them. Misan is the Greek word here as in misogyny, you're lower than, lesser than. And instead, follow Jesus in a life committed to his call, as we heard in that first prayer, to love God and to love our neighbor. So, looking at this call in the light of the last several weeks, we see that this call is embedded in all of the things we have learned over the last weeks. Because it's a hard ask to hate your life. And this passage, this passage that we read today can be read to mean sacrifice yourself, which can then be interpreted to sacri sacrifice yourself to another person, to an institution of marriage, or an institution of the church, or a job, to make ourselves lesser than another person, lesser than an institution. But I don't think that's the call. Our call is to be God's servants in the world, and if we're going to be God's kids, God's children, as I am my daughter, my mother's daughter, my mother wants me to shine. She wants to be proud of me, to be the best people we can be for God's sake. 
As it says in Matthew 5, no one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And of course, that does not mean bragging, putting on the ash cloth. Look at all the good I did in the world. That's not going to make your mama proud, not going to make your dad proud, not going to make your God proud. What it means is simply that your compassion, your love, your kindness, your creativity, your courage is so open and free, so faithful that God's love will hold you even when things get hard, that it's so dedicated to God that it's just going to shine out and you won't be able to hide it. It will shine and shine and shine. And here's the thing, because part of this is dying to the things that stop you from shining. Because if it can't shine out, then God is probably calling you to reprioritize your values, probably calling you to die, to hate some of the things that you thought were right, that would make you good, so that you can truly do the work God called you to do. Remember, Jesus upturned those tables. And those tables, we don't think about it now. We think, oh, it's money changers. They, they were doing what they were supposed to do. This would be like Jesus coming in and taking off my chasuble and burning it and knocking down the baptismal stand and tearing out all the pews. This is not Jesus going into Wall Street. This is God, Christ in the temple saying, this is not the temple. The temple is the risen Jesus. The temple is love. This call to hate our life is so supported by God's unequivocal love. Trust in that. Trust that no matter what happens, and a lot has happened to me in the last two weeks, no matter what happens, God's love is unequivocal. It's okay. You can let that stuff go. If you're grounded in love, You'll always feel God there with you. There's a lot of examples of people who died to one life to take up another. And since it is St. Patrick's Day, guess who I'm going to use as my example? <laughs> so St. Patrick was actually the child of a wealthy, many of you probably know these legends or stories, history, he was the child of a wealthy English family. And he was kidnapped when he was 16 by the Irish and made a slave and taken to Ireland. And then he escaped. So what many of us might do is go back to England in our nice, cushy, wealthy life, right? But no. St. Patrick died to that life. He hated that life. He put it lesser than the life he was in. And instead, he became a great evangelizer to the Irish people, the very people who had enslaved them, gave up his resentment, his anger, his wealth, his life to evangelize to the Irish people converting so many in Ireland to Christianity that he's become their patron saint. And I bet we could all come up with a dozen more examples. MLK, PhD, intellectual, marching across bridges and doing Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, lawyer, trained in England in a loincloth. There's so many, and there's lots of examples in this very room. So on this last Sunday of Lent, on this turning point of our journey to Holy Week, 
I ask you to think about what you need to deprioritize, what you need to hate, to die to, so that you can rise up and shine, so that you can be a freer human being, a servant of God, ready to do Christ's work in the world. Because wherever Christ is, his servants are too. Amen.